This is our first lesson for chapter 10. Yeah, it's the chapter that's all about waves, and we'll sneak a little quantum mechanics in at the end. Um, and right off the start, right at the beginning, I think we need to spend a second and kind of ask ourselves, well, what exactly is a wave? Um, I've got a little animation here that uh, shows a little wave moving along, and it's kind of like a little wave of ping pong balls that are, that are wiggling. Um, and, and this is what you need to have a wave. Things have to be dynamic in time. They have to be changing as time goes by. So every second you look at it, it has to look a little bit different. And it also has to be different as you work your way along through space. So at any one position, you might see the ping pong balls are doing one thing, but at a different position, the ping pong balls are in a different location. So this is a beautiful example of a wave. Uh, one thing to notice is you can see this wave kind of casually moving to the right. It has this slow velocity to the right. But if you watch an individual little ping pong ball here, it never actually moves to the right. This particular one with this type of wave, it's just wiggling in place right here at location negative 2. And it's going up and down. Yet the wave itself, this energy disturbance, does actually move down the line. Um, a couple of other ways to look at it. If you were to look at something that's just like this, just like the ocean tide going up and down, that's not a wave. Even though it changes in time, so at one moment it's high, and then another moment it's low, and then another moment it's high, it doesn't have a, a changing um, appearance as you move left to right through space. It doesn't have what we would call a spatial change to it. Uh, likewise, if you had something that looks like this, you know, maybe a graph from Math 12, that's not a wave either, even though it does change as you move through space. So here at negative 2 from my location, I'm right in the middle of my graph, and here at around, I don't know, negative 1.75 or negative 1 1.5, I'm up high, and then in the middle, and then down low. This thing isn't changing as time goes by. It has some nice little wavelength to it, but it doesn't have like a frequency or a period. And it has to have both in order for it to be a wave. It has to change not only in time, uh, but also spatially through space. Then it can be a wave. We can take a stopwatch and we can time how long it takes in order to have you know one crest leave and then another crest arrive. That's actually going to be what we call the period for the wave. Um, we can also quickly take a ruler and measure from crest to crest and find out how many meters it takes in order to see the pattern repeat itself. And that's going to be the wavelength. So let's, um, let's jot a couple of things down here. Let's get this to work. All right. So a wave. Uh, a wave is just an energy disturbance. There's some energy that's been dumped into this story. In some sort of medium, it could be a slinky. It could be just air molecules that are all squished together. Uh, but there's some material that you're sending this wave through. And this energy disturbance has to move through time. So as time goes by, you have to see a change. And it has to be an energy disturbance that moves through position. It has to have a spatial change to it. So at one point, things are pushed one way. And at another place in space, they're pushed the opposite way. Uh, saying that in a couple of different ways. Um, at any one location in space, if you just freeze one location in space, the heights of the ping pong ball, if you're watching them, they have to change as time goes by. So as the, the clock in the classroom you know, advances, you notice that, yeah, this ping pong ball is never at the same spot as time goes by, even though I'm standing at one place in space. Um, at any one time, if you freeze the picture, you know, take a photo of it, you'll notice that the ping pong balls are at different heights as you move through different positions in the classroom. Okay, parts of a wave. Just so we've got some common vocabulary here, um, here are some things that we, uh, we like to say when we're trying to describe the different parts of a wave. If you were to take a look at the wave frozen in time, so I want you to imagine you've got this wave that's moving and then you just, you just go click and take a little snapshot of it so it kind of looks like this. Okay, so it's frozen there in time and you, you move your way through space. Then what we can do is start putting some labels on here. The amplitude is how much the energy disturbance shifts away from center. So it's just measuring from the middle all the way to the top in this case here, or all the way from the middle down to the bottom. That'll be the amplitude of the wave. Uh, in this spot right there, you've got a crest where you're up at the top, kind of at the peak in the wave. And sometimes people will call this a trough when you're down in the valley, down in the bottom. And if you've have frozen this picture by you know, taking a, a shot of it and just looking at it on your phone, if you measure with a ruler how far is it from here to there, that's the wavelength. 
And we're actually going to use the Greek letter lambda, which kind of looks like a like an upside down Y. Uh, just the Greek letter lambda. That's our kind of typical variable we like to use for wavelength. And uh, we might, you know, sometimes measure it in centimeters or millimeters, but it's always safest if we can measure that wavelength, which we'll denote with the letter lambda in meters. Okay, well, what about changes in time? What if we pick one spot in space, maybe just right, right here, maybe right at the origin here, and just watch this ping pong ball going up and down, and we just graph its location as time goes by. So a graph where time is the bottom axis, and then the location of this ping pong ball could be the up and down axis. We can still talk about the amplitude, but now this axis of the graph is going to be time. And if we measure how much time it takes to get to a, a full repetition, that's going to be the period. And in physics, we typically go with the capital T for period to talk about how much time it takes for exactly one cycle. All right, one, uh, one equation we're going to use a lot is the wave equation. There's actually a beautiful version of this using some calculus, but we're going to use a nice, uh, nice simple one that'll get the job done for us. And I always remember it as uh, velocity is just measuring meters per second. And that's exactly where this wave equation that we're going to use sort of comes from. You can say, okay, the velocity of the wave as it makes its way slowly to the right in this case, uh, it's going to go one wavelength, right? That lambda we were using in one period in the time it takes for one cycle. So lambdas are meters, period is the seconds, and there's your wave equation. Now, in the first chapter of Physics 11, we talked about how you could say frequency is just the reciprocal of period. And it just looks a little bit nicer to, instead of having this divide by period, if we instead multiply by frequency. So we often do that. Usually, we'll just write this equation as V is equal to lambda times F. And we're going to call that our wave equation. Like I said, there's a, a more exotic version of it from calculus. But this one will work just fine right now. So let's try it out with this example here. It asks us to go and find the frequency. OK, so that's this letter F uh, for some water waves that have a velocity as they move sideways of 1.3 meters per second. And the distance from crest to crest is 3.9 meters. Um, so yeah, just using this wave equation, V is equal to lambda F. We know V, we know lambda, and we're looking for F. It's literally that simple. We'll just take the 1.3, divide by the 3.9, uh, and we're there. So it looks like the frequency for this is 0.333 hertz. Let's do a little more involved example here. Uh, let's imagine you're sitting there in, in the lake doing some swimming, and you notice that some waves are going by just continuously. And they, they travel a nice long distance, you know, maybe from one dock out to a raft somewhere of 28 meters. And it takes seven and a half seconds for these waves as they're just rolling through the lake uh, to make that, that distance of 28 meters. Uh, you quickly take a, a meter stick and you measure the distance from the crest to the nearest trough. So that's not a full wavelength, right? That would be just the distance from here to there, be half of a wavelength. Uh, and you notice that that's 60 centimeters, or I guess we could say 0.6 meters. And the question is, if you just sit there floating in the lake, how many waves will go by you every two minutes? So there's quite a few things going on in this example. Uh, let's start slowly tearing it apart. First thing I might want to do, uh, don't worry about the wave equation for a minute. Let's just watch these waves just make their way through the lake. We'll do a little d equals vt. They're not accelerating, so we don't need to do a 1 half at squared. Uh, we know the distance that they're going to go. We know the time, so we can throw those numbers in. And when we divide, it looks like these waves, as they just slowly march along through the lake, are going 3.7 meters per second. So great, we found the V. Sometimes we're not going to use the wave equation to get the V. We might just use D equals VT. 60 centimeters was from a crest to a trough. Not a full wavelength. You'd have to go crest to crest or trough to trough. So crest to crest will be 1.2 meters. That'll be our lambda. And now we can dive into the wave equation. V equals lambda f. We have the V, we have the lambda. And then we can go and find the frequency for these waves. So the frequency in this case is around 3, 3.11 hertz. Uh, that's how many waves will be going by every second. So it's pretty quick. It's like wiggle, 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 right? Three wiggles every second. And um, we're, we're now asked, well, how many waves would go by you in two minutes? 
Well, I guess that's 120 seconds. So going back to the first chapter of Physics 11, we know that frequency is just number of cycles, that's the n, divided by some random time that you wait. Not a period, but just some random time. So I'm going to put that two minutes, change to seconds in there, uh, and then we can solve and, and find the value. So there'd be a whole bunch of little ripples that would go by. 373 little ripples would pass you if you were just standing there in the lake watching these waves go their 28 meters in 7.5 seconds. Uh, next issue, um, let's talk about wave velocity for a minute, specifically the wave velocity in a slinky for how fast waves can move in a slinky. Uh, I've got a little animation of that here. See if I can just dig this quickly up. Um, so speeds, yeah. If you send little wave pulses down a slinky, uh, it ends up doing exactly what this little animation here shows. If you send a little one down followed by a big one, even though the big one has a much bigger amplitude, those pulses actually travel at the same speed down the, the string, down the slinky. So the actual speed does not depend on how big the wiggle was. It will depend on how tight you have that slinky tensioned and how massive that slinky is. But it's not going to depend on the amplitude. So maybe we should jot a couple little notes in here. The wave velocity does not depend on how big the pulse is. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, that means that when you're playing a guitar, if you play it quietly or if you play it loud, it won't go out of tune. What the velocity on a slinky or a guitar string does depend on, so this is very specific to a, a slinky, it depends on how tight the slinky is or how tight the guitar string is. And if you have more tension in your guitar string, the waves travel at a higher speed. Both little ones and big ones will travel at a higher speed. And it depends on how thick the guitar string is, how dense it is. If it's a guitar string that has more kilograms per meter, if it's more dense, then the waves will travel slower than they would if it was a nice thin little string. And you'll notice this on a piano, where it's got some very thick strings and some very thin strings. Uh, they do that on a piano so that, roughly speaking, the tensions are the same, um, but there's definitely a difference in density, and that's going to give you different, different tones for the different piano strings. Now, there is an equation that we'll, we'll use occasionally that works for slinkies. It works for guitar strings. Uh, that's kind of what it's specifically designed for. And the velocity of a wave as it travels along a guitar string, it's, uh, it's a little complicated. It's the square root of this fraction. And on the top of the fraction is how tight the string is tensioned in newtons. And in the bottom, it's, uh, it's a linear density, not kind of like the volume density you might calculate in chemistry where you'd be calculating kilograms per you know, meter cubed or grams per liter. Here it's kilograms per meter length of guitar string. So you take how many kilograms it is and divide by how many meters long it is, and that's this value for mu. Uh, just to let you know, the, the mu values are often quite small when we're calculating these. Just taking a look at the way this works with the tension being underneath the square root sign, um, that tells me that if you did take a guitar string and increase the tension by a factor of 49, if you made this number 49 times bigger, once you root that 49, you'd have a value of 7. The velocity of the waves in the guitar string would be higher, but it wouldn't be 49 times higher. After you root that 49, you'd see that the velocity is only 7 times higher. Okay, let's try this out with a guitar string. We're going to use this interesting equation that's specific for guitar strings and, and use that to help us find the velocity here. So it says a guitar string has a mass of 1.48 grams. It's pretty light. We'll have to change that to kilograms, but for now that's useful information to know. Um, the length is 74 centimeters, not even quite a full meter. And we're going to try to find out how tight it would need to be in order for a wave in your guitar string to have a frequency, there's that value for F, of 440 hertz, which I think what, is what the band people call an A. Uh, it has to have a wavelength of half a meter for its lambda. So lots of info. Let's see if we can slowly tear this apart. Um, I might go to the wave equation first. And I'm going to put in information about the wavelength being half a meter and the frequency 440. And it looks like we need a wave velocity in your guitar string of really fast. 220 meters per second. That's how fast the little pulses are going to go down the string. Great, so we have that value. Uh, next thing, let's go and find this mu, Okay, the number that's going to be in this bottom part of the fraction here. 
So that mu is the kilograms divided by the meters. So when we do this, we're going to have to make sure we convert things here. And we'll change our 1.48 grams to decimal 00148 kilograms. Likewise, we'll change the centimeters to meters, and then we're going to divide. And as promised, this mu value is pretty darn tiny, decimal 002 kilograms per meter, like 2 grams per meter. All right, now we're ready to try out this guitar string equation, specific for guitar strings. We have the velocity of 220. We have that mu value, the linear density, decimal 002. And now it's just a little math 11 game. Probably best to square both sides. And when we do, the 220 gets pretty large, 48,400. Uh, but at least the root sign's gone. Then we can multiply both sides by that mu value of decimal 002. And there's the tension. Uh, that's how tight the guitar string would be. And it's pretty tight, 97 newtons. So that's, that's enough tension to, to hold up like tw you know, 10 kilograms of mass, or about 20 pounds. Um, it's pretty significant tension in the string. Uh, next issue, uh, let's take a look at a couple of different types of waves. We're going to specifically look at two, even though there's, there's at least another one out there, but we're going to look at two. Um, there are a couple of different ways that you can wiggle a slinky, so to speak. So let me just see if I can find my little animation for that. Yeah, right here. So imagine these are two slinkies. And the red one, somebody has done a little bit of a push-pull action to send the waves down. And on the bottom blue one, somebody has waggled the slinky side to side. And these are the two different types of waves that are out there. The red one is a, a P wave. It's like a push-pull wave. And the bottom one is an S wave as it moves from side to side. And it gets those names P and S from, uh, from when you, know, you study earthquakes, you have primary and secondary waves. But I like to think of the P as push-pull and the S for just side to side. Officially, the red one is called a longitudinal wave, and the blue one is a transverse wave. So let's just jot a couple of notes down here. For the longitudinal wave, the wiggle is parallel with the overall velocity of the wave. Um, let's just put all this up. So the disturbance. Right, that, that wiggleage, right, you see the little particles in the slinky wiggling left to right in this story. Uh, that's the disturbance. And then the overall information of that wave travels, in this case here, to the right. And so the disturbance is lined up with the velocity. And that's just done by creating a push-pull motion. Those P waves travel a little bit faster than the S waves. And so again, just looking back at the animation, uh, if I watch this little red dot here, it just wiggles back and forth a little bit, but it wiggles left and right, and overall I can see that wave travel to the right. So those are lined up. In contrast, the blue one, the wiggling, so to speak, is up and down in this picture, but the information of the wave travels to the right. So there's like a 90 degree difference between those two things. So those are transverse waves. Let's just put all this up. So for a transverse wave, the disturbance, the wiggling, so to speak, is perpendicular to the overall wave velocity. Uh, it's just a side-to-side -side motion, right? And that's I remember that just for the S and S waves. And they typically travel, you know, for earthquakes, a little bit slower than P waves would. For slinkies, too, they travel slightly slower. Okay, next issue. Uh, anybody who's been on a school bus... Oh, sorry, the one last little thing we're going to add in here. Um, this will be important later. Um, much later we're going to talk about polarizing waves. And it turns out, when we do get to that point where we talk about it, only transverse waves can be polarized. Longitudinal ones cannot be. Okay, next issue. If you've ever been on a school bus in the rain and you've watched the windshield wipers, you'll, you'll notice that sometimes they're wiggling together and then a few seconds later they're, they're fighting each other and then a few seconds later they're wiggling together again. And in the world of physics, we refer to that as phase. So imagine you've got a couple of slinkies kind of sitting right side by side with each other, a red one and a blue one. Um, if they're wiggling exactly in a synchronized way, you'll hear physicists say, oh yeah, the, the waves are in phase. They're happening at the same time. Uh, this picture here, one wave is a little bit late as time goes by. The blue one has a slightly earlier wiggle in terms of time, and the red one starts to wiggle a bit later. And people would look and they would go, well, it's close, but it's a little bit out. And you might hear somebody say, yeah, they're, they're slightly out of phase. 
if you have them completely going in opposite directions, like the wipers on the bus, one wiggles to the left, one wiggles to the right, and then the reverse a second later, uh, you'll hear people say, oh yeah, those bus wipers, or the, the waves you see on the, the notes here, those are completely out of phase, exactly opposite to each other. And so that word phase is just a quick little word we can use to talk about whether things are synchronized or not. Uh, next issue, we're going to talk about what happens when multiple waves on a string actually meet each other. Uh, so let's take a look at this page in the notes here. When waves do meet, here are a couple of things I can promise you will happen. As they pass by each other, they don't actually collide, they will pass through each other. But in that one moment when they're sitting in the same place in space, whatever their amplitudes are, they're going to briefly add together. So if you have a guitar string with two little wave pulses heading down towards each other, the little one's going to the right, the big one's going to the left here, they will pass through each other. They're, they're not like cars that are going to collide and bounce off each other. But at that one moment when they're both on top of each other, the overall amplitude will add up. In this case, you know, you've got a little bit up and a lot up. That'll add up to a whole bunch up briefly. But then those individual wave pulses will continue on their journeys. They just pass right on through each other. If you have one pulse up and one pulse down, as they pass through each other, they'll tend to cancel each other. In fact, they'll perfectly cancel each other if they're the same size. Um, if one's bigger than another, you'll still see a, a slight overall uh, amplitude as they pass right through each other. But this is what we call superposition. It just says, yeah, you can have two waves sitting on top of each other at the same time, and then they will pass through each other. All right, we're going to move on and do just a little bit more to make the next lesson a bit shorter. Uh, we're going to go and take a look at reflections of waves at boundaries. Imagine you've got two people stretching out a slinky and you start to send waves towards each other. When the wave pulse energy gets to one side, gets to where one person's holding it, that energy has to go somewhere. And if you try to hold the slinky really, really tight, it doesn't just disappear. This energy will actually get reflected back if it doesn't get transmitted into the person. So these uh, these pictures are just some pictures that you're going to have to have to memorize. So just four scenarios here that, again, we'll just commit them to memory. If you've got a slinky attached to a rigid wall, like a concrete wall, when that pulse goes in, it will come back. But when it does come back, the reflected wave will be on the opposite side. Sometimes people will say, oh yeah, it's had a phase change, right? It's done a complete reversal of its amplitude. Um, and it'll just bounce right off of that rigid wall. If you can find a way to keep the slinky tight, but have it loose on the end, so maybe you support it with a thin little piece of fishing line out here, you'll find that the wave energy still comes back if it's totally free on that end, but the reflected energy comes back on the same side. It doesn't come back out of phase, so to speak. It just comes back on the original side, right back at you. It's a little bit more interesting if you tie two slinkies together where one slinky is thick and one is thin. These are just some pictures that we do have to memorize. And here's what happens. Um, if it's not a rigid wall, but just a heavy slinky, you'll get a little bit of both effects. You'll get some transmission into the thick slinky and some reflection. The part that gets transmitted in is going to be on the original side. So you'll see a small little wave pulse travel through that heavy slinky. But in some sense, it's kind of like you've hit a wall. And a portion, a fraction of the reflected energy will come back at you. And just like hitting a wall, it's going to come back upside down. It's going to come back inverted okay, with that phase change. The reverse is interesting. What if you have a pulse going down a heavy slinky and then you head towards a light one? Um, a little bit of the energy will get in and a little bit will be reflected back. The part that gets in is always on the same side. So that's consistent in these two stories, right? Transmitted energy on the same side as the pulse. But now it's kind of like hitting a free end. You're hitting this very light slinky. So you get a little bit of energy coming back, and a fraction of that energy will come back, but it'll come back on the original side, just like it did on the top of your page there, where we were looking at just a simple free end for a slinky. Now those are stories about reflected wave energies for a slinky. Um, we're also going to be talking about light waves bouncing off of a mirror. So we're still talking about reflections. It's just that, you know, if I can go back here, here's the reflection for a wave 
on a slinky or a guitar string hitting the end of a guitar. Uh, let's talk now about a light beam, and a little beam of light waves bouncing off of a mirror. So we, we talk about the rays as being like incoming and outgoing. So the incoming one is the incident ray, and it's coming into this mirror. It's going to bounce off, and that's going to be our reflected ray on the way out. Now in physics, we love measuring angles compared to a line that's perpendicular to the mirror. We call that the normal line. In science, normal just means perpendicular, right? Which is what this little math symbol means. So if I draw in, if I sketch in a normal line there, I can see how beautifully symmetric this story is. And we're going to talk about the angles being measured compared to this normal line. We try to avoid measuring the angle compared to the mirror. It just works better for our work with lenses down the road if we measure to this thing called the normal line. And so I have my angle of incidence on the way in and then my angle of ref uh, reflection on the way out. And for a mirror, for a light beam, a beam of light waves, those two angles are identical. So as far as an equation goes, wow, is it ever simple. Uh, just that the angle on the way in is equal to the angle on the way out. Now the next lesson we're going to talk about what happens if a light beam tries to go from the air in a classroom into a glass window pane. And it turns out a little bit of the, the light will bounce back, much like a mirror, but some will get into the glass. And we're going to see next lesson that it actually does this interesting little bend. We call it a refraction. Uh, but for this lesson, we're going to stop here at reflections. So if you have light beams reflecting off of a mirror, the angles are the same. And if you have uh, guitar waves bouncing off other guitar strings, they might do this if it's two different guitar strings of different thicknesses. Or if it's just one guitar string, that's what the reflection looks like there. And that's going to be the end of our first lesson.